So hello and welcome everyone to um, Pandemic Flight 2020. We are now at cruising altitude and we'll be making our preparations for a descent very shortly as we continue on with our ongoing Tarot On event of live videos every day during the great global lockdown of 2020. And hello to Evelyn who's joined us in the uh, live group and to all those joining us in the recordings as well. Thank you for your time and attention. We are the um, original online order of hermits, the ooze, and um, we have been making a safe and um, delicate journey across the um, uh, airways of, of lockdown here as, um, as we um, have gone up the tree of life through our studies over this time. So I would like you to start to uh, look around, collect up any um, uh, rubbish or refuse. Um, someone will be around the plane very shortly to begin to collect that as we begin to make our descent back down from our elevated heights that we are getting to today and tomorrow. We started yesterday, I introduced um, the book The Experience of No Self by Bernadette Roberts. There's another book um, called The Journey to No Self that Bernadette Roberts wrote, but I think The Experience of No Self is the um, um, preferred uh, startup book for her contemplative journey. Yes, make sure your tables um, um, are in an upright position and um, that we're all facing forwards. We have reached across the abyss where, um, as we saw in our spiritual journey, illustrated by the tarot, that we start off basically where we are, we then um, think, oh, maybe there's more to the universe than meets the eye. We become a theoricus. We then um, begin to dwell in our dream world, our astral world, our psychological world, our psyche and so forth. Um, we also learn a new form of identity in theoricus, which is initiated of the path of the sun, which is um, also um, corresponds to Tifereth, and therefore it means um, we pick up a lower reflection of Tifereth down in Esod through the sun path. We then um, begin to practice our actual magic, which we're going to do today. We are going to practice some sigil magic, so we're going to do some practicus work. We then perfect our philosophy a little bit. Um, start to pick up our devotional journey, our contemplative journey. So I guess this is magic and this is mysticism as far as the uh, map goes. We then um, uh, are initiated into Adeptus Minor, which crosses the veil. That's a totally different set of awarenesses um, that um, transcends all of these lower forms. And then we go back round this whole circle again, bringing the sun with us um, as we go round this again until we're ready to um, um, contact the knowledge and conversation of the holy guardian angel. From that point, we then major in our practical work and become an adeptus major, designing our own magical system. And then we come across to the adeptus exemptus, which is the height of our mystical journey, where we throw away the self and all notions of separateness in order to cross the abyss, um, where we encounter Karamzon, the demon of the abyss, all of these forms of identity that's And the Magister of Templi um, basically disappears and becomes a point of no self. And then eventually the Magus um, presents their word to the rest of the universe because they're now aligned with the Logos in order to um, take the final path, the leap of the fall, into Kether, um, about which nothing can be said other than silence. So it's um, a lifetime journey, if not more than one. And um, um, not everyone 
it's not it's not necessary to make the journey this is the thing um, because um, we are always already there and it's the moment we start searching it's always already too late because we have moved away from the sense of unity that um, we exist in and the universe exists in all of the time. It's only because we have accreted so many shells ourselves of separateness that we have to work in order to um, remember, um, well, to um, in effect um, remember our forgetfulness or forget our remembrance of, of the original state. Okay, so um, we are talking about the abyss um, and these upper Sephiroth uh, today and tomorrow. And I read yesterday, if you weren't here yesterday, then um, um, I read a section in Bernadette Roberts talking about what she calls the passageway. And that is a sort of equivalent of the abyss. And we left Bernadette Roberts thinking, is this it? Is this the state that I'm going to be in forever? Thank God there is no um, self left because otherwise the self would go mad at this particular stage at that um, altitude. Um, we are cruising at a very high altitude now. But I did want to give some practical um, uh, techniques today and then as we make our gradual descent back down into the new normal that we're going to land in at some future point then um, I'm going to almost recap the journey going back the other way um, so that we get more and more practical all the way back down to tarot card readings of when will Dwayne come back to me um, which is sort of where we started about 50 sessions ago. And in order to do that, I'm going to be uh, reading from Tarot Time Trailer the next um, few days and so on. Um, this book comes from a lot of research that uh, my co-author Tali, uh, Tali Goodwin, did on early cartomancy. And we wove it all together with little vignettes, which then became a sort of staple, I think, of, um, of uh, Llewellyn books um, thereafter. Um, but it covers basic cartomancy and also the interesting thing that we discovered during this time is there always seemed to have been a missing time for tarot. If you think about tarot and someone put in the Facebook group today a sort of, oh, it, um, I really like going back to Italia and Papers and um, 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 oh, um, a, a lot of these sort of early French um, um, occultists um, before the Golden Dawn put their stamp on it. And um, the thing is, is that the early occultists made terrible mistakes. They, they um, lied through their teeth. They um, came to dreadful conclusions. They had a very basic knowledge academically, historically, even spiritually and esoterically about Kabbalah and about ancient Egyptian hieroglyph, um, hieroglyph and so on. But they um, did have a really cool attitude to synthesizing all of these things. And it's really, um, I like to go back to paper myself because Papus was a, a great teacher or tried to be a good teacher and was quite honest about, oh, I don't like things that uh, muddle my brain. I like simple methods and simple um, keywords and things like that. So we have that period of French occult with Eliphas Levi and then Kenneth Mackenzie met Eliphas Levi. Kenneth Mackenzie was um, a well-known Freemason. He probably wrote the cipher manuscript that the Golden Dawn um, used in order to, for Westcott and um, uh, Woodman and Mathers to form the Golden Dawn in 1888. And then um, um, there was about 12 years of, at the height of the Golden Dawn, maybe 20 if you drag it out a bit, then Crowley, and then it disappears until the 60s. So yes, there were a couple of world wars in 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 that place. It's a bit like um, uh, the Rosicrucian manifestos 
um, there were three of them produced and it formed a whole sort of viral marketing campaign in Germany. But then there was the 50 years war and it basically cut short all of that um, um, explosion of esoteric thought and um, uh, musings and sharing and so on. And in the same way, they sort of put a cap on it and then later discoverers of the um, Rosicrucian Manifesto then made a massive um, um, story, narrative, uh, um, magical orders and everything else out of that. And in the same way, the Golden Horn sort of was cut short, Crowley's work um, and so on, um, had two world wars, and then there was a period, particularly through the 30s, 40s, and 50s, um, where tarot vanished. And it wasn't until uh, Stuart Kaplan came along in the sort of, well, he picked up on the vibe in the 60s, um, um, the Thoth Tarot was published, uh, republished in the 60s, um, and um, that whole sort of late hippie vibe picked up on tarot and Eastern um, esotericism. But um, the Western esoteric stuff had sort of vanished. It wasn't until a little bit later that that picked up again. So where did tarot go in the 30s, 40s, and 50s? Well, the answer that we found is in a very strange place. It actually was carried along quite happily, and it was published a lot, and it was developed, and it was merged with cartomancy and all sorts of other things, and the missing time period we cover in this book, because it was in women's magazines. In the 30s, 50s, um, 30s, 40s, and 50s, a whole load of women's magazines were busily um, producing articles left, right, and center, um, a little bit like this sort of fate magazine that we have here, where we have the gypsies, of course, and we have the, the Waite Smith deck, and of course, we know the Waite Smith deck came from um, 1909, so it had nothing to do with the gypsies, and we have the tarot, dun, dun, dun. Um, and so all of these um, uh, books, uh, magazines, women's magazines would have knitting patterns, they would have adverts for the new washing machines that were coming out. They'd also have two pages on how to amaze your friends with cartomancy. And so the women's magazines carried the whole tradition in public, but sort of hidden, of cartomancy. And then what happened is um, everyone's grandmothers had read those magazines and so on. And then when people nowadays said, oh, my grandmother taught me or whatever, a lot of that material you can find almost word for word in all of the women's magazines that were produced between the 30s um, and the 50s. Um, there, there was even one um, magazine, um, Women's Weekly, that published their own tarot. And um, that's called the Tom Lang deck, and um, I have a copy of it somewhere, and it's a gorgeous um, deck. It's, it, it's just so much of its time. The people um, in it, the children in it, the men and women in it are like literally of the 50s, and it's a very similar sort of deck. But that's where Tarot went in that missing period. So we're going to go back down and look at some of our actual history of to our cartomancy and um, um, so on. And as Helen's saying, um, yeah, I mean, throughout all periods, we have the sexism. Um, I mean, Crowley, um, maybe not quite to so much extent, but um, um, certainly Blavatsky, um, that all of these people were off their time, it has to be said. So, um, um, I'm not sure, um, Terry Census, what, what's, what was that um, uh, that Michael was saying? And as Diane said, it was a matri um, matrilinear um, um, preservation. It went through women's magazines. Um, and it was only the, um, I, I guess, the French occultists that were sort of mainly male-dominated. 
the Golden Dawn had men and women in their own, so that was fairly equal. So it was founded by three male Freemasons, of course. Okay, so what we're going to do today, I'm going to read the second bit of um, Experience of No Self, because we're right at the top of the tree, and I wanted to put in um, some of our deepest consideration of what this whole journey is all about, if you want to skip that far. And also, over the next couple of days, I'm going to be reading from Rebel in the Soul, um, which is an ancient ritual, one of the oldest rituals that is still served. And this is a beautiful uh, rendition of it by um, uh, Beaker Reed. Um, and we ha we have to use this as a ritual. Um, it's a very gorgeous um, sort of retelling of the story with illustrations. And um, uh, Tolly Goodwin, Charlotte Louise, Derek Bain, and I actually did a ritual quite a while ago based on, on this. And as far as I know, it was the first time anyone had done the, the, the ritual of this for three ten years. So actually performing or conducting a ritual with um, 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 sort of 3,000 year old um, ritual text was something quite incredible really and so i wanted to share that with you so that we can see that on our way um the gender age and so on in the world um we um the last time we looked at it we used instagram um so we did another um thing on gender and age on instagram instagram has a slightly younger audience but the male female ratio is exactly 85 15 80% female, 15% male. And it is, um, as far as over the last 20, 30 years, there's literally been that um, um, ratio 85% female, 15% male. That just seems to be the way of things. So, um, um, I'm um, tired of lockdown up in the street at the moment, and um, she's getting on with. Um, uh, there I say it, um, some work on Pythagorean numerology for our Andrea Green book, for our Andrea Green book uh, on numerology, which we're hoping to finish once the um, lockdown is sort of over. Um, Mars is asking, why do you think it is the 85D in uh, male, female? Um, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm I'm really not sure that um, we could have a long, long series of debates about that, but now is not the day to do it. So I'm going to talk about sigils. Now, I hope they all brought um, some ambition or aim that we're going to turn into a sigil. Today, I'm going to teach you a very basic way of doing sigils. There are lots of different ways of, of utilizing sigils. So let's start at the very basics while you think if you haven't got one, of a sentence that sums up some aim or ambition that you wish to achieve or be encouraged in or, or um, invoke into your um, uh, world. So when we're thinking about it, Jules, um, Austin Spare, I wrote this down, uh, Austin Spare, 1988 to 1956, he was a guy who Alistair Crowley thought was a black so Alistair Crowley thought that Spare was a bit weird. So that tells you a lot about Spare. Um, but Austin Osman Spare is credited as one of the uh, influences on chaos magic. And um, he worked on sigils, something he called the alphabet of desire. Now, he says very interesting about sigils, which is they are the means of guiding and uniting noting the partially free belief. The means of guiding and uniting the partially free belief. Now, by partially free belief, he means something, as we talked about yesterday and the day before and throughout this whole thing, in this liminal space of you have to be truly believing it's what you want and clear on that, but on the same time, not bothered about it. So that is the state of mind that you have to be in in order to make magic work. And um, 
in Carl's Magic, there's actually a formula for how does it work. And um, um, I think I, I disagree with Pete Carroll on the formula because if you take it back to a zero point, it doesn't work. And so the maths is wrong. But generally speaking, it does um, have a lot going for it because it, it looks at the components of how does magic work. If magic works, and surely everyone would learn it and everyone would be instantly rich, instantly famous or whatever they wanted. And obviously the universe doesn't work like that. So magic does work because it works by us aligning ourselves to our partially free belief um, and getting to the top of the tree as high as we can in our system mind and then co-creating through into manifest existence and the further up you go the less you want and so the US is very economical um, it doesn't allow um, people who just want what they want to really get it by being lazy and getting a spell it don't work like that um, and I can tell you that for sure however it does work when you are completely free of the attachment to the aim so that is what a sigil helps generate and what um, Austin Spare found would work. Now, there's another most important thing that I found in the years and years and years of doing this is that um, it work far better if you are already doing it and earthing it. That is to say, if you're already looking for a job, applying for every job that comes along that is appropriate, preparing for um, interviews and everything else, and you do a signal or a spell, you are far more likely to get your most ideal, brilliant job rather than casting a spell and then sitting down and waiting for your mobile to ring or a text to come through. It just don't work like that either. It can do, but it's a lot more difficult to make it work if you're not providing it a nice opportunity to um, do it. Okay. Um, so those are the two main things. It has to be an A that is that you can put yourself in a halfway stage, a sort of weight stage, and you have to be looking for it as well. That does help. So I'm going to write my A on here. So I'd like you to follow through with me and we're going to make a sigil, then talk about loading it um, and casting it. So we create it, we then load it and we charge it or cast it. Okay? Uh, sort of different stages doing this. If you want, you can add some of the stuff that we did a little while earlier about our basic ritual with the purification, the consecration, the invocation, you can do all of that as well around sigil. The Golden Dawn have a very long, complicated process by which you make a talisman, and the talisman um, has for um, the ritual and your clothing and your wand and the talisman have the four worlds of color fastened to them corresponding to them. So you build the temple in one world, you then build your robes and the colors that you use in the next world down, the creative world, Bria, and then um, all of the ritual implements are in the color of Yetzira for that particular planet, so say if it was Mars or something like that, or Venus or Jupiter, and then your city has the Asiya colors. So when your mind is loaded with all of the symbolism, you're basically looking at the entire universe, channeling down through color into your sigil. So you can you can wrap this up, up and down the worlds. That's fine to do. But we're going to do a very simple one on, on a bit of paper. Um, 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 Charlotte, myself and Janine once went to a um, opening of, um, it was like a for the witches of Eastwick TV series. 
and um, we were there to um, demonstrate some some sort of witchcraft and um, just do tarot readings for the journalists and things like that, which was a very interesting, strange event um, for all sorts of reasons. But um, we did this. We did this visual spell, and one of the journalists, I think it was for the Metro um, in London, wrote it up, and sure enough, they, they, they got results. It was something to do with finding a flat um, or getting rid of their flatmate or something like that, um, or finding a better flatmate because their flatmate was causing them issues. And um, sure enough, something happened literally the uh, week after, and she wrote it up in the newspaper, which was um, very nice of her. So sigils, here we go. I'm going to it's mine and I've been stalling for time because I can't think of one um, so I'm going to input um, um, my aim is to um, 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 easily complete and I'm going to Put um, project A on it because it's a secret project. So my aim is to easily complete project A um, in the sort of safest way um, possible. Okay, so that's what I'm going to do. Now, I'll, the next thing that I'd like you to do is boil it down to just three words, if you can. So um, take your whole sentence and just choose three words. Three a spell as they say so i'm going to um i'm going to have easily um, uh, um and i'm actually going to put in a new word as well um, um efficiently i think efficiently and i'm just going to write the letter a at the end so easily an a okay and <laughs> make tony Potter. that's a good one yeah that's it brilliant okay so easily efficient now what i want you to then do is boil it down into three letters three letters you can choose the first letter of each the middle letter of each or the last letter of each or just a random letter of each one okay so i'm going to go with um i quite like the y and the e the A. Hmm. So for me, it spells like yay. Okay. So that's what I'm going to do. So I'm just boiling down into this. Okay. And then what I'm going to do is make a sigil of it. So I'm now going to rearrange these letters in a sort of sigilized form. And you can put the letters on their sides, you can make them smaller, bigger, but join them together in some pleasing way that might fit in a circle or a square it doesn't really matter so um, i'm going to have my um in fact I'm going to have my y as a more straightforward y i like to say so there's my y then i'm going to get my e down the side like so so there's my e so i've used that a bit to make an e but do how you want like a bind ring, um, or like um, you can do sort of Gaudier as well in the runic tradition when you have an actual binding mantra type spell. Um, in uh, the runic system, it's called Gaudier. So um, now I need to do my A. Um, ah, now I can put my A upside down and make it part of that bit there. Okay, so I've made my A upside down and put it onto that top bit there okay and now i'm just going to fancy fire it up, what i call fancy fine it up so i usually put flourishes at the end of the um line and maybe put a circle on it somewhere to show it's um an end so i'm going to put a circle on that bit and then i'm just going to um modify these um three end bits okay so just give me a second while you do this as well, and um, then you'll see what it's going to look like when we're done.
I'm going to put mine in the square. There we go. So there's mine. So that's my room, and I've, I've concentrated so much on that, I'd forgotten what the sentence was. It's exactly the point, which is exactly the point. Now, if you have something to do with your house or with your protection, then obviously you might want to cut out the room, and put it underneath the house, underneath the doorstep, um, underneath the mat front of the door or if it's a protection room you might want to put it in a brooch or bracelet or put it in your pocket if it's to finish writing or something then you want to put it in your desk drawer when we're done with it um and so on okay so obviously what, what you're going to do with the room will depend on the intention for it okay so now you've drawn your room and um, your sigil, um, your sigil. Um, what I want you to do is now take some of the words like easily, efficiently, A. I want you to write it backwards, okay? Write it backwards underneath. So I'm going to do mine, A, I, L, T, N, E, I, C, E. F F E I L I S A E. Okay, so um, just write this bit backwards. Okay, so that's backwards. Um, you can put it in a square, a circle, a triangle, whatever seems to fit. Again, in a slightly advanced method of this or intermediate method, then you choose um, relevant. Um, shape. Um, actually, in the numerology book, I put some to work based on numerology as well. So, a square would be for something you want to construct, a triangle, something you want to focus on. A circle would be healing, like um, um, Inga's saying, um, a circle is good for healing or protection. Um, obviously, a pentagram, uh, you put it in if you're feeling. Um, that you need something energetic like Mars related and so on. But for now, just put it in a shape that's to fit it. Okay. Then what I want you to do with the backward sentence is just literally write it in a way that you could pronounce it as close as possible, a phonetic way of saying that. So here I've got Alint. So I'll write Alint. Okay, and I'll put an INT here, just to make that pronounceable. Uh, pronounceable. If I went A Litini Kefi, Yilis A say. So I can sort of mangle it. Um, they don't have to be mirrored. Um, these letters just backwards there, and the letters in the sigil can be any way. They can be mirrored as well. I could have be on the other side. Um, do what is most pleasing for the sigil. Okay. Quite often, you know when you've got the sigil because it looks right. It just looks right. Okay. Um, um, this actually fits very well for for, for this project actually. Um, just the way it's shaped. Um, this sort of upper arm thing up at the top of it. Okay. So I'm going to write this phonetically underneath. Um, so, as best I can, um, um, Alit Ni um, Cafe Y Let's say. Okay, so I've now broken that up as best as I can into something I can pronounce. Alit Ni Cafe Y Let's say. Alit Ni Cafe Y Let's say. And I've done that from that backwards. Make sense? Good, good. When it, it comes out with a pleasing shape or a pale one. Okay, we got something that we can say because I'm going to demonstrate in a second how to then this sort of called loading the room or loading the sigil in this case. 
and that we could load it by putting it on a silver plate, etching it under a full moon with four candles burning and all sorts of other things. But we are just loading it with the shape, with the letters. That's all we're doing. And we now have to charge it or cast it. And there are lots of different ways of casting a spell. Gerald Gardner listed the sort of eight means of um, um, getting into an altered state, which was basically scourging, 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 being naked, sex, scourging, and being naked. That was Gerald Gardner. So for those of us who are not Gerald Gardner, what we're going to do um, is we are going to um, just see this. Like a circle of power, when you cast it in a Wiccan circle or witchcraft circle, as you build a cone of power. So you um, um, uh, dance or circle while chanting, and it builds up and builds up and builds up. And at a particular point, the high priestess usually says, down, and you go down to the ground and you earth it and you stop dead. You are absolutely stop dead. So you can utilize that, and this is the best way I found of teaching this basic way of doing it, um, so that you don't have to um, spend ages getting into a trance state um, just by repeating this until it's time to stop. And then stop dead in your tracks, and then either rip up the sigil, burn it, or go and immediately place it. It is a loading because what we are doing with this is we are forcing it and again there are lots of different rules for how this may may work but at this level let's just see that we are taking it um um, um actually dion fortune as well was said to use some um um ritual in order to, um to um, um change course of the war and it was rumored that um which has used it to um uh, brew up a storm um against um um one of the attacking french units i think um that's the story anyhow so what we're going to do is we're going to say this say your thing repeatedly you can do it with me and then immediately now in my case what i'm going to do is i can leave it on my bit of paper and then i'm I'm going to use it by putting it in the back of the book um, that I'm using as reference for this particular project. And then I'll, I'll get about it. The next thing to do is remember what Shakespeare said twice in two different ways, both in Macbeth and The Tempest. He said, hush, the, the spells wound up. Hush. We made the sign of silence afterwards. So let's do that as well. We'll add that bit. Left finger just here, and then you never think about this again. You never mention it again, you put it out, the, out of your head, okay? And that's the difficult thing as well. Um, in Chaos Magic, one thing you can do is wait until you sneeze, and then the moment you sneeze, you put the sigil in your head and you fire it out with sneeze, although nowadays that is probably not a thing to do because you need to sneeze into the back of your elbow. So, I'm going to say this repeatedly until it um, sounds a bit mad, and then I'm going to stop, and that will, will um, solidify the uh, sigil. Makes sense? I hope that makes sense. So I'm going to do this and working through the ritual with you. So um, here we go. Yeah, you don't have to tear it up. Well, um, you can um, you can even copy it. You can copy it onto another bit of paper or some fabric. Um, um, you be quite experimental. With it. Um, that's one of the things about sigils that you can modify them. Um, you can draw them on wood and then throw it in a river. Depending, say, if it was a um, unbinding spell that you wanted to let go of something all sorts of things, okay? But this is the basic method um, that we have to create the jewel, create the mantra, and then utilize it, and then cast it. Alitni ni kefe yi lisai. Alitni ni kefe yi lisai. Alitni ni kefe yi lisai. 
Alain Kepi and the sign, Alain Kepi Yon, E Kepi Yon, the sign, Alain Kepi Yon, the sign, Alain Kepi Yon, Alain Kepi Yon, the sign, 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 Alain Kepi Yon, Right. Right. Okay. So um, let's um, drink to our casting. Earth it. And forget about it. Sometimes when you do things like that, it does break the internet. So um, I do apologize for that. So uh, what I'd like to do, um, we're going to leave that where it is. Um, but if you've got any questions about the mechanism of it or the method, um, then um, ask it in the Facebook group, but forget whatever we've forgotten about. Sometimes the sigil can be really ugly and nasty and not seem to fit and be a bit messy and stuff, and um, that's fine as well. And if you like to do research into sigils, then Olin Osman's Spare is a good start. And um, I've got some stuff on sigils in the Magister, I think, and also a numerology book by Andrea Green will have sigils in it as well. But tarot ones based on numerology, um, slightly more elegant way of doing it. So we're going to pick up um, at the very height of our journey before we go back down with. Um, what I believe is one of the um, true purposes of all of this work is not necessarily about getting what we want, it's about finding out what is true in our experience. Actually, experiencing that truth as a consistent, comprehensive, and congruent state of awareness with the universe as it is, with no intermediate filter. So, Benedette Roberts has gone through the experience of no self. She's then gone through the passageway, and now um, it was a bit later on the uh, story, just after that time when she felt that um, 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 knowing the truth doesn't necessarily make for a better life, a life that must go on whether there's any truth or not. That's where we um, left her. Yeah, the basic, the basic method. And I haven't really changed in, in 10 years. The basic teaching methods haven't changed um, at all. So, Roberts, Chapter 6, The Experience of Self. It was late winter and the muddy waters of the river jammed with burnt debris from a mountain fire two years before. Every day, my son and I would stand on the banks to measure the height of the swelling waters. Then he would use a swift moving losses target practice for his rocks. He had a strong pitch and a good eye. One day, however, he was late in coming, so I walked down and sat on the river's edge, watching the dead wood in its speedy descent to the sea. With neither reason nor provocation, a smile emerged on my face, and in the split second of recognition, I saw. Finally, I saw, knew I had seen, I knew, the smile itself, that which smiled, and that which it smiled, were one. As indistinguishable, one as a trinity without action. And what I saw was merely how this was so. There was no insight, no, no movement of anything, but a that was as natural and spontaneous as a smile on her face, not another thing more. In my journal, I called this the grin of recognition. 
Since what I had seen could not be retained, grasped or held onto by the mind, I continued to watch the river as it cleaned out the mountain debris and washed down the banks in its determined flow to meet with the sea. Later, I took a walk and saw that although the great passage was now over, everything looked as usual. Nothing had changed and it was good to see this was so. If there was anything marvelous or spectacular about this seeing, it was the fact that everything was as usual and that nothing changed because it meant that the two was as usual and had arrived at the end of the passage, normal, whole and the same. I was grateful for this. It was almost too good to be true. And yet, how could it be otherwise when that which remains at the end of the passage is itself normal, whole and sane? It may seem strange to have rejoiced more in the ending of the passage than in what had been revealed there. It must be understood, however, that I could not rejoice in what had been revealed because I could not grasp it or hang on to it. It was so utterly simple and so completely obvious it was impossible to understand why I'd not seen it before. And yet, there's no way I could come to this seeing of my own accord. It had to be revealed. What I learned was that the unknown object of the smile was identical with the subject. And not only that, but the smile itself was identical with these, a threesome in the words. And what is the smile? It is that which remains when there is no self. The smile is neither the unknown subject or object, yet is, it is identical with it. It is that aspect of the unknown which is obviously manifest. The implications of seeing are tremendous, and yet they cannot be grasped by the mind. The full implication of this, however, was not immediately apparent. Though the pressure behind the eyes never returned, and mind knew an effortless silence despite the routine of daily affairs, life went on as usual. I was not aware of any real change. Then, about a week or so later, while on my way to catch an early bus, the usual void was replaced by something else. Something was not localized as a presence, but something more pervasive and intense than the oneness I had seen earlier. Immediately, I took this for an absolute sham, a trap, a trick of the mind. Besides, it came too late. I was now beyond all such enticement and that had landed me nothing but trouble in the past. So I ignored it, refused to give it a or look at it. And if I had have had a self, I probably would have felt toward it a thing of disdain. I walked on, looking straight ahead, and went to work. But it also went to work. So surrounded me, I could hardly divert my eye from it. This went on for several days until I knew that the greater my attempts to ignore it, the greater it increased the pressure to look. So eventually I did look. The moment I did so, it vanished and was gone. But in the same instant, I knew why. You cannot look at what is. You cannot become an object to the mind, nor for that, sir, can it be a subject? For what is that which can never be a subject or an object? Thus, the moment you look with your relative subject orientated mind, what is is gone because you try to make it an object and it won't work. Why? Because there is no subject. The relative mind cannot apprehend this reality. Only a non relative mind sees because what is is equally non-reflective or non-self-conscious. Since what is, is all that is, it has nothing to see inside itself nor within itself. And thus, it has no such thing as a relative, collective, self-conscious mind. Nor is it a mind at all, nor consciousness, for no man knows what it is, only that it is. Therefore, once we have been rid of a reflective, relative, self-conscious mind, then and only then can we come up what is, which is neither subject nor object, but seeing itself. So that was...
was reading from the experience of no self by Bernadette Roberts, her journal of the um, initiatory trip that she took through um, a form of Christian contemplation and mysticism that eventually led her from Malkuth to Keith when the mountain becomes a mountain once more. And she went through these stages, you can map the experience of no self and the um, section at the end of that where she explains the different stages um, through the tree of life very, very clearly. Um, when she talks about the passage, you already know she's talking about the abyss. It's, it's very clear, the mapping, which is why I to like her um, very um, clear journaling through that. So um, thank you all. I hope um, we forget about our sigils and get on with our days, look after each other. Tomorrow we're going to start to head back down the tree of life and make a safe distance from our very elevated um, uh, condition here in Keitha. And we are going to um, um, come down the other side of the mountain and um, um, do some more practical stuff as we come down. So thanks a lot for your time and attention as ever. O O O O O O H S. Julia, if you read the book, that's the best way of uh, me answering any of the questions that are in it. Um, allow Dick Roberts for herself. Okay, bye for now.